Welcome to Playing in Traffic. Playing in Traffic. You guys, welcome back. Thanks for coming back for another week. Another welcome. episode. Welcome back, y'all. Welcome back on this snowy, snowy day. Yeah. Is it snowy where you are? It's snowy where I am. Is it snowy in Brazil? I know, you guys. We got listeners from Brazil. I know. Is that? I think that's our newest country update. That's our newest country that we've added. I hope everybody's having a great week. Today we're going to talk about some serious stuff, Lindsay. So, um, yes. you know, but first I want to kind of give some updates. Did you guys see Great Light Studios had a QA and a last, uh, last night? Well, now it's last night, but I don't know when this is going to air. But anyway, a few days ago, uh, Great Light Studios and Jordan and Kelsey and Edgar, who's also a former member, they did a really thorough and long and uh, really interesting conversation, a Q&A. So people were asking questions through the chat and then they were answering them. And there were some really good questions that they talked about. So, yeah, that was awesome. That was really exciting. Though. Check it out. And it they was, even uh, talked about was, us at the end. It was cool. Yeah, it would have been Wednesday, the 26th of January. Right, right. Whenever you're listening to this of 2022. I don't know what year you're listening to this. I don't know. <laughs> So Great Light Studios, if you want to listen to that. That was a really yeah, good one. It was a good one. It was it, a really the longevity of all three of them. I'm like, man, I would I, be exhausted by the end of that. So that was cool. Good job, guys. You guys all did a good job. To be honest, they talk so much about the Bible, and it's a little bit like takes me back to my church days. And so sometimes I have to like just watch little bits at a time. Yeah, it's a little bit overwhelming to me. It kind of makes me feel like I'm back in a Bible study, even though that's you know they're not even – you know, they're just proving our Bible studies, but still, it just sort of like, yeah, the tone you know, of the, the way that they talk and stuff is sometimes, yeah, triggering and yeah, speaking so. of triggering. Mm-hmm. Well, hold on, you guys, I just want to tell you just a personal, personal challenge update that I did. Do you guys remember when I talked about how I was going to do the yoga challenge? Today is day 27. You guys, I freaking made it this far, and I definitely think I'll make it to day 30. But I just wanted to let everybody know that I'm doing it and that it sucks, and it's <laughs> not easy. It's about 20 to 30 minutes a day, and I like it because she posts it that morning, so I don't really know what's coming until that day. Because sometimes if I know what's coming, I'm like, oh, man, I don't want to do that today. I think I'll do something else, you know what I mean? But because she posted that morning, and then I have no choice and have to do whatever it is. So my body is so sore, but I'm already seeing changes in my body. So what me and my husband were talking about the other day is like, you don't realize how quickly your body can change. Like even within 30 days, which is not that long, you know, you can like kind of change the shape of your body. So that's really fun. You know, that's a fun little benefit of it. But yeah, anyway, I just want to let everybody know. um, And I hope you, you know, even if you guys maybe like stopped your challenges or, you know, stopped whatever you were doing, it's okay. Just jump right back in. It's all good. Today we're, yeah. So um, I hope everybody's doing well and everybody is staying healthy. This is um this episode today is something that we've been wanting to talk about for a while, huh, Lens? Yeah, I'm excited for this one. But the longer that I was researching for it, the more I was like, we got to put a good trigger warning before this because this is not going to be for. If you're in a weird mood today and you don't want to hear these horrible, horrible things about the worst things in humanity, then you should pause this and come back to it on a day when you feel like listening to something like that. Or if suicide is triggering, um, like really intense cult details are triggering, right? Just be so prepared and like be willing to turn it off if you get flustered or if you start to get overwhelmed because we don't want you to feel that way. It's just that today is just very serious subjects. Um, we're gonna explore some other cults in the past that are well known. Um, really well known for their mass suicides. So today we're going to cover two cults. Lindsay, um, actually, we both have researched them a lot in, in the past because we've been very interested about them. Did you want to say something? I think that I think that it's um, we didn't even really plan this, but I like that you're we're going to cover Jonestown today and Heaven's Gate. And you connected a little bit more to the Heaven Gate doctrine, right? When did you yes. feel like not the doctrine, but kind of like the way that their community was? And um, I felt more of a connect, not connection, but yeah, a connection, an John interest too. in Jonestown. So Tony's going to cover Heaven's Gate. She did like the in-depth research. I'm going to do Jonestown. But I think that's fitting. We didn't even really plan that out. I was just right. realizing that as we're starting that um, 
those are like specifically we connected with those like in different ways for different reasons so yeah so when I first was coming out of the cult, they um, had a documentary come out called Heaven's Gate, The Cult of Cults. And I really recommend everybody to watch that because when I saw that, I was so shocked at the similarities and not the doctrine, uh, but we're going to talk about how similar the doctrines are, which might surprise some people, surprise me. But I was shocked at their lack of individuality. I was shocked at their um, their language that they used, the way they spoke, their mannerisms, all that stuff, because I saw that in myself. And I saw that in the church members and in my group. And even though they had a totally different doctrine, you know, that just like really shook something in me. And I thought, oh my God, they are no different than me and my friends and my cult. And so, yeah. So this, so for me, Heaven's Gate like really touches my heart a lot because I feel like I understand them a lot. Um, I, and I think a lot of people are are familiar with Heaven's Gate, but we kind of hear that over time and then it sort of gets watered down and then we hear rumors and stuff and it was really sensationalized because of their, their deaths. But we just want to come on here and just give you guys some facts, you know, of, of really what happened and kind of put it into context. So the Heaven's Gate cult was started by two founders. Okay, their uh, official names were Marshall Applewhite, and he was the man. And then the woman was Bonnie Nettles. And they called themselves Tea and Doe. And it comes from the, um, the sound of music. They were really into musicals and uh, musical theater and stuff like that. They called themselves the two, Bo and Peep, um, but mostly tea and dough. And they really claim themselves to be the messiahs. And to be honest, she, uh, Bonnie Nettles, T, she was really the one that was um, leading the group. You know, she was really the leader. And so, you know, their, their doctrine is so interesting because it was actually Bible based, which is so fascinating to me. Because when you hear about Heaven's Gate, you think, Oh my God, they were weirdos who believed in UFOs and they believed in spaceships or whatever. But you guys, we have to remember, okay, so this was in 1975 is when they began like working together and kind of calling people together. In 1975 was sort of when like UFOs, um, you know, alien life was starting to become of great interest in the world, you know, like we were going to space and we were discovering things out there. And, and so this wasn't really an uncommon thing to be interested in UFOs and alien and space life. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like it wasn't that strange. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't that strange to be interested in. And to be honest, I'm fascinated in space. Who isn't like, there's so many mysteries of the galaxies, you know, we don't know. So anyway, these really smart people who are sort of already interested in that kind of stuff. Um, so then T and Joe, they start putting out flyers and they start having these meetings sort of all over the country and start gathering people together. And um, they promise to lead their members off of Earth on a spaceship and take them to a next level. And so their, you know, their whole thing is about leaving this life and um, not leaving this life. I don't want to say that. In the beginning, their teaching was about denying yourself of this life and only looking forward to the future life. Um, and they just had um, like a lot of communal living. So they all lived together. They all left wherever they were. So what happened was when they would go to these meetings, all of a sudden they would go missing. So family members were like searching, like where did my daughter, where did my son go? And so what they would do is they would just you know, travel around the country and kind of living like nomads, you know, just just going wherever life took them and praying and just living this communal life together and, um, you know, studying their doctrines. Would they like, I don't really know, would they like rent houses or did they camp? I think it was more camping. Oh. I think it was more camping. but Like a caravan of cars and stuff? Right. So they originally believed that... They would all ascend together to heaven and they would they would get on a UFO and they would all go to heaven together. OK, that was the original doctrine. But then what happened is in 1985, T, Bonnie Nettles, 
suddenly died of cancer. And that wasn't expected. And see, when I heard that, it just totally reminded me of my church because we also had a death in our group and it just like kind of like sort of changed everything. Everything like just took a different turn. Time too, wasn't it? Well, she died in 1985 and yeah. he died. Yeah, exactly. Like, so exact same timing. Right. So right after that, you know, um, Doe was Marshall Applewhite, the man, and he took it very hard. And after that became pretty extreme and they sort of changed their beliefs after that. And now they believe that they would, they would not ascend to heaven alive, but that they would need to leave their, they called their body, their vehicle, which is really interesting. Um, and so they needed to leave their vehicle in order to enter the next level. And that's, so what happened was, okay, so I really want to just emphasize you guys, like how normal these people were. And these were smart, educated, normal, young, young, young people, you know, early twenties, just searching for the truth. And they come across, you know, these two leaders who were charismatic and nice and kind and loving, and they seem to have all the answers. And, you know, for whatever reason, those people when they're at there that moment, they were able to, you know, just just connect to them. And so from that moment on, they were just indoctrinated. And so some of the culty things, you know, that culty, I say culty, but you guys know what I mean. You guys know I hate that word. I just really see that they had a loss of individuality. And that was just so, so what's the word I'm looking for? Familiar to me because my church did not allow any kind of individualism. And so what the Heaven's Gate cult would do is they all got the same haircuts even the women they got really short haircuts they almost look like men like they just didn't want to they didn't want to have any gender they just yeah. they gender just, neutral gender neutral like but but to an extreme where they weren't individuals at all so they they cut their hair they all wore similar clothing and when i saw that i was like oh my god we all wore similar clothing too you know even though it's completely different it's completely the same yeah. you know like yeah, their hairstyles and their outfits were different, but but the the process, the indoctrination, the brainwashing is all the same. The control, the control is the same. That's the whole point is the control. Um, they would change their names also, which in my church, there were also a lot of um, cases of name changing. And all of their names were, they would end in Odie. So there would be like um, Glenn Odie, uh, Chicote, Sirote. So they all sort of had similar names that they kept. And, you know, that was another way to get rid of their individual identities. They had their own language. You guys, like, they're really, like, when I was looking, um, I want to talk to you guys about their website because they still have a website up and somebody still takes care of it. But um, it's almost like reading a whole nother, a whole nother language thing. So they have their own language. They call their body their vehicle which I think is interesting because I think it's a way to, um, again, get rid of your identity. So you're separating, separating yourself and sort of making it like an inanimate object instead of your body, like another way to, to take you away from your body. So they called their body your vehicle. So they wanted to leave their vehicle. Um, they called themselves classmates. So like, you know, they were in a class and they were each other's classmates. I think they also called T and Doe, you know, father and mother. So they had sort of some similar language, but you know, their language is so interesting. And I encourage you guys to go on their website and check it out. They have a website that is up and is still active. Um, and like I said, the what it's so they're so smart and articulate, but interesting. And it's very hard to read, but um, yeah, interesting. You, you can send them an email. Yeah, people to this day, there you guys are still believers in this cult. And um, there are still some people who take care of care of the website. And I heard that if you email them, they'll answer back. I haven't done it. And and we can. And we'll let you guys know what happens. So so actually, what really touched me about them was all of this stuff, you guys. Like, just their loss of individuality, um, all that stuff. I just, God, I just want to cry thinking about it because that was me. And it just in a different way. And um, so that's why they really, really, really shocked me. Like, shocked me awake out of out of that cult. But what they're really known for is their um, their ending and how, you know, their tra the tragedy of how they ended. And it was really sensationalized in, in the news and everything. And I, I do want to talk about it because it is an important part of the story. 
but I don't think it's the most important part of the story. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, they had an awful tragedy, but like the, the more severe tragedy was the way they were able to be my, you know, the way that their minds were able to be controlled and manipulated and the way that they left their families behind because they would go missing for years without calling their families. And that causes so much heartache and so much pain. And I also want to give a shout out. There's a Heaven's Gate podcast. That's what it's called. Heaven's Gate podcast. My friend Joshi from, you know, oh, my dear, dear friend that I know for a long time. He told me to listen to this podcast. Um, it's narrated by Glenn Washington. And it is so moving because he interviews some of the family members. And you can just really feel like the long term effects, you know, of this trauma and this tragedy and not just the fact that they died in such a tragic way but also the tragedy of like they lost their family for years at a time and you know living all around the country did you know that they spent some time in boulder colorado yeah, which i thought was really interesting they did a lot of colorado traveling actually they every time they say colorado we would be like what um that was the saddest part i think for me i think i paused it at the parts where they were um talking to the family about when one of the members called yeah. And they were like had been working with a I, they were working with coal experts because they did they were they didn't know what to do. This was a severe, like severe in the in the podcast at some point. But um they were trained kind of what to say and what not to say if he ever called or showed up or like contacted. Oh, right, and right. That for me was like I had to pause that because it reminded me sort of of how I would feel when I would talk to you. Like you can't overdo it. You can't you you can't push them past their point because it's just going to turn them away from you. And so you're like overly thinking and overly calculating how how to approach the conversation. You're trying to sound calm, but really you're just like, where are you? Like, I'm sending the police for you. I'm going to track your phone. I found this. I found that part so heartbreaking. I agree. That was because so yeah, I agree. They were they were being so careful on what they said. But do you know what else is interesting, Lindsay, on the other side of that conversation? that cult member was doing the same thing. Yeah. Carefully calculating every little thing they wanted to say and like wanting to say so much more, wanting to say so much more, but not being able to. And like, they probably had tea and dough sitting right next to them. So they weren't really able to say what they wanted. You know, I'm sure that there were people around them. Yeah. So, yeah, I just want to say that was a tragedy, really, really tragedy. But of course, so this is what Heaven's Gate is known for. And, and, you know, people make jokes and stuff about it, but but it's really tragic. Guys, wait a second. There's one more quick thing I want to go back to before we get into this, this part. One of the really interesting things, um, going back to the asexual part where they weren't really interested in any kind of sexual activity, um, several, not all, but several of the males in the cult and the group were castrated. Actually, they did the first castration by themselves. And it ended up not and not going well. And somebody almost died. They had to take him to the ER. So after that, they started doing them in the hospitals. But eight males were castrated, um, including the leader, Marshall Applewhite. He was also castrated. So this was definitely something that he was struggling with personally. You know, I don't know. He just had wanting everybody in the group to be like him. Like he was right. track- he was asexual. And so he's like, well, let's all do that. That's what right. that's what God wants us to be. Right. So even if the other males were not castrated, they were not allowed any kind of personal relationships. They were all celibate, right? Yeah, they were all celibate. Yes. Like the true deep believers. When we hear that, we're like, oh, my God, that's so extreme. You know, but don't discount the things that you will do, you know, when you're so far indoctrinated and and your mind is so far away. And that's what brings us to our next point. Um, So in 1996, they rented a huge mansion in San Diego County and um, prepared for, you know, what would become what they're really known for and, you know, a great tragedy. So um, San Diego County Sheriff's Office went to the mansion. That was when they discovered uh, 39 bodies, March 26, and they, they discovered 39 bodies that had been deceased by a mass suicide. And they... It was considered a ritualistic suicide, which means they went through a whole bunch of different steps, different plans. It was all very thought out um, and planned, you know. So and I think that that's really the thing that fascinates a lot of people. So one of the things that they did was they made exit videos and exit statements. 
And they went on camera and they explained exactly why they wanted to leave their vehicles and enter the next level. So there was a comet, the Hailbot comet coming. And um, what year was that? Let me look up exactly what year that Hailbot comet was, because that would have been the day. So they committed suicide over a period of three days. So March 22nd to March 26th. Um, so, okay, so that's what happened. So they, um, this all started on March 22nd. And so that's when they made their first exit videos and their first exit statements. And then they started sending them to um, some former members and to the newspaper and to the press. And so then um, they were discovered on March 26th. But over those three-day period, they they had groups of people who um, committed suicide together. And Applewhite was one of the last ones to commit suicide. Uh, some people call it a murder. They believed that they were going to, you know, somebody had seen something at, uh, at the end of the Hale-Bopp comet. So in um, some astrologer or something, uh, noticed a little speck behind the Hale-Bopp comet. Only one. There was only like one case of this being, you know, seen. But they believe that that was a UFO that was coming, you know, coming to rescue them. So that's why they picked that specific time and that specific date. And um, what they did was they mixed some bar barbitual, is that how you say it? Barbituals with applesauce and pudding and vodka. And they, they drank that. And um, that sounds like a peaceful way, you know, to end, luckily. And they all had the same outfits on. They all had the same haircuts when they died. Um, they all had black shirts, sweatpants, and brand new black and white Nikes. Have you guys ever heard people talk about Nikes? Mm. Like when they talk about Colts, yeah. it was because they had these specific Nikes that they all wore. And it's funny because not funny, nothing about this is funny. But after um, this tragedy, the Nike um, actually discontinued that set of Nike sneakers. Oh, did they really? They yeah, did. They don't yeah. Want to be associated with that shit. But you know what? Nowadays, they said if you can find those, they're worth like thousands and thousands of dollars. People really want them because they were discontinued. You know, yeah. they're like a collectible item. But yeah. but they said the only reason that they bought them was because they were on sale. Really? Like, there was no real reason why they picked Nike or anything like that. You know, it was just like a good deal. And so they all got them because just like any cult, you know, they all had their money together and, um, you know, they all controlled the money. So everything was done communally with their money. So they would have gone out and bought everything together and bought their outfits together. They all had five dollars and 75 cents in their pockets, which was also very interesting. And they believe that that was, you know, for their fee to enter onto this aircraft that was going to take them away spacecraft. So this is really, really what they're what they're known for. Um, and that's that was how they were found. So those packages that they were sent with their exit videos. And OK, so if you OK, so if you guys go to their website, it's heavensgate.com. They have Earth exit statements from a few people. Everybody's exit statement has um, why we must leave at this time. And then they have another thing why I want to leave at this time. This is my personal reasons as an individual for making this choice is what it says. I'm going to read. Okay, you guys, I'm going to read from Chakoti's um, exit statement. And this is from why I want to leave at this time. Okay. And this is his number two reason. But I encourage you guys to go and just read through some of these things and you can really see what kind of mindset they were in. Okay. So his number two reason for wanting to leave. This is quoted, it is hard for some to believe that I would choose to follow my teachers in this transition. And that's because they incorrectly identify me with the vehicle. And then it has little quotations body. Some may try to find something in the vehicle's past to explain this so-called bizarre, really quite natural behavior, but there is nothing there to find. This vehicle had good parents and the vehicle's life was happy and normal by any standards. I know I was very lucky that the next level thought I would follow my heart and go with my instincts and try to gain membership into their kingdom and take this vehicle with me. We know it was hard for some of the relatives to accept the choice we made, but this is not any fault of ours. The they feel is rooted in ignorance who the Heavenly Father is and is right to call those souls ready to return to his house. There is only one real family and it's not determined by the flesh, but by the mind that occupies the soul. It could have been seen as an, as an honor to the family tree that one of its members could house a soul that would choose to make this final transition. But unfortunately, 
There was so much distortion and confusion that it caused needless suffering. Many times I wish those who knew the vehicle could share in my joy, but their misunderstanding blocked them from taking advantage of the growth that was also offered them. God, I just want to cry. I just want to cry. Does that not sound like your church? God, that sounds like me. Like, yeah. Like I could have wrote that, like having pity for unbelievers and like, yeah. Like even in, even this this most awful thing, even even suicide, you know, like the point of death, they thought that was right and that their family was wrong. But you, but even in that statement, you can feel his love for his family. He's yeah. saying, I have good parents. I have, you know, like everything I have is good. But this is my decision. And, and I feel bad for them that they don't understand. Yeah. Oh. So I encourage you guys, if if you're up for it, you know, like Lindsay said, if 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 you're up for some serious reading, you know, go on their website, check it out. And, and just remember that these are real people, real, real, real. This could be your family member. You know, this could be you. Yeah. And um, and um, it's interesting. And I think I, I really wish people would study this more because, you know, we need to to be aware of, of what could happen to us. Crazy. I know there's so it's much more crazy. that we could talk about, but I know we have we have another cult that we want to get into. I just, I just feel so sad. Another thing I want to say is if you guys go on YouTube and we can also post this, you can watch you can watch their um, exit statements. And those are really, really, really disturbing, but also I think important to watch um, to really understand the mindset that they were in right before this. This yeah, uh, mass suicide. so happy. They were so happy. They were so joyful. I mean, they genuinely wanted to do that. And I don't know. That's very sad. Which is a good transition. We're going to go back in history. But Jonestown is a really, really intense. So definitely don't let your kids hear this part because this gets like real, real ick. Yeah, that's the thing of um, with Heaven's Gate, they were all adults. And let me just say one more thing uh, really quick. When they found them... Um, they said that 39 men had been found in a mass suicide cult. So a lot of the family members were like, oh, good. It wasn't my family because, you know, there are females in that group. Yeah. Well, it was because they all had short my hair. Fine because they only right. Them. My daughter's fine. She, you know, she wasn't there. But actually, upon later investigation, they found that, you know, they were also females. But there were no children. So that was one thing about Heaven's Gate, you know. Thank, thank goodness, because they they weren't into sexuality like that. You know, there weren't uh, there weren't babies being born. So yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. Your turn now. No, oh, I could just keep going. It's so interesting and so sad. It is so interesting. Yeah. Okay, okay, guys. Let's hear about Jonestown. I'm gonna sit Jones? back and smoke. So, I feel like most pop culture, most people have like the basis of Jonestown is like the biggest mass suicide in world history. Before 9-11, it was the the highest casualty of U.S. citizens. Wow. And so, okay, Jim Jones. In the 50s, Jim Jones started a church called the People's Temple uh, in Indianapolis. And it was a liberation theology. I had to do some digging to find out what it was like, what kind of religion it was considered. It's like a new new age movement. Very, at the time, radical. He was preaching to the poor and um, integrating churches, which wasn't really a thing back then. And so it was very radical. You're talking about integrating like black and white? Yes, yes. So, you know, in the Midwest, you went to mm -hmm. a white church. What year was that? I'm so sorry. What it year? was started in the 50s. So like 50s. So that's pretty radical for the 50s to have black and white people yeah. all, all being in church together. Yeah. And in Indianapolis, like the Midwest. Right. So he was considered like, this new age movement, you're thinking like 60s, people are kind of in the hippie movement. So it's a Christian Christian doctrine, but radical, radical for Christianity. And mm. so looking at this church, like sort of how you look at the Heaven's Gate members and you can kind of see how they get to that mental space. When I read about the beginnings and the origins of, of the People's Temple, I think if I was born in a different place and time, I could totally see my child it for sure. Because the things in the beginning that he's teaching are like um, everybody needs to be included, and racism is like the problem in America, and poverty, and like you know the rich people are like making life hard for the poor, and it's very like communal living eventually. 
Um, mm-hmm. But like his teachings were like, yeah, I could see how like people mm-hmm. got a lot at that time, you know. Um, if you weren't, if if at the time with like the New Age movements of like the Eastern religions coming over, like if that wasn't your thing, like the yoga and the the Eastern theologies, this was like a form of Christianity that was still kind of radical and cool, you know. Anyway, so eventually in the 70s, they moved to, oh, 1965, they moved to California. And then um, eventually ended up in San Francisco. So Jim Jones, his character, too, he's kind of like a religious Elvis. Mm-hmm. He's got glasses. He's charismatic. He's He reminds me of Elvis. Like, every picture I see of him, every video, he's just like a, a, a weird religious Elvis. So that's in California is when he starts getting um, accused of, like, financial fraud, physical abuse of the members. That's when um, he's like getting into the drugs and the alcohol and he's getting kind of um he's starting to get paranoid so he begins this concept of like we're going to move to South America and start our own commune because the government's going to try to come after me like they hate us what year was that uh well he started doing this about three years before but they moved down there in 1974 he was like finance like he was doing like financial stuff because there was this so his was more like financial like you join mm-hmm. the church, Drugs. you give the church, you hand the church over all your money and your house and everything and everything. And you live communally. Mm-hmm. So his was more driven by money and power. For sure. Heaven's Gate, Heaven's Gate felt a little more like um, together, swimming through it all together as members. But this was very like power structured, like Jim Jones was the boss. You hand him your money. You live, you all live together. He's the, like, you got to follow what he's saying. And he was like abusive to them, like physically abusive. Like if you didn't mm. have doctrine and like. But not uh, in the beginning, right? But that came later. No, he started right. off like, it looked like a good thing. It was like inter- integration, but he was kind of like preying on the African-American community. Mm-hmm. Because he mm-hmm. was like, I need all of these people to join my church. If mm-hmm. I'm let's, let's be together. So, and that's something that I'll talk about kind of towards the end, which surprised me because I didn't know that about it until I was researching this. But so anyway, so he's kind of putting it in everyone's ear, like the government hates me. They're coming after me. They're making all these false accusations. Let's move to South America. So he sends a crew down there three years ahead of time. They start building this community. And then um, in 1974, they actually, he moves down there. The government is like coming after him. So he's like, okay, I'm out of here. (laughs) Classic cult behavior. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> so let's go. Um, I just kind of want to go back though really, really quick because I was yeah. just, I'm so sorry. I just got kind of yeah. high and I was thinking about what you said about um, the the power structure. I do think Heaven's Gate had a clear power structure. T and Doe were the leaders, you know, yeah. maybe just not as um, like fanatical or like uh, showy because Jim Jones was showy. He wanted yeah. people to see his power. Yeah. But see, T and Joe wanted power within their tiny little group. I don't know that they wanted like like a lot. I don't know. I don't know. I, 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 I think it's just a different maybe it's still power structure. It just looks a little bit different. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Maybe like the motive for it, I guess. It felt maybe. I yeah. feel like with Heaven's Gate, like they truly, I I just think it's all control, 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 control for everybody. Yeah. I, I feel like, especially at the end, Doe went through a mental breakdown kind of. Yeah. And but so see, did Jim Jones. Well, yes. But you see like one man, uh, I don't know. They you can't compare them. You can't compare yeah. them. But but we want to because they did. You know, it's so it's so much like we want to put them in a box like this cult leader and this cult leader. Yeah, yeah they are similar, but they are so different. So, yeah. OK, I'm so sorry. Go back. No, you're OK, right. so then they're so then they're going to um, they're going to South America. Ghana. Is it Ghana? Is that how you say it? Yeah, Ghana. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So now they moved to Ghana and, and they call it Jonestown, right? They Jonestown, call it Jonestown. Yeah. yeah. It's actually, it's in Ghana, but they, they call this community Jonestown. And this is the part that I was like, I would have probably been down for this. Like, it looks cool. It looked fun and cool. They communally, like, they just built all of their houses. They farm. They live on their own. They're just like this big family. They all take care of each other's kids. It just looked like, initially, like a cool commune. For sure. And they all believe in, like, love. I mean, that's like the surfacey like presentation of it right obviously inside right. In, in the depths of it it's very like scary and uh, that was kind of what started happening was he started getting more paranoid um getting more addicted to like heavier drugs and alcohol and 
making sermons all night long on the loudspeaker. So people started leaving, but but he would collect, trying to leave, trying to leave because they would take their passports from them and all of their money, and he would reiterate that to the members like. What are you going to do? You have nowhere to go. You have no money. You have no passport. They were out in the jungle. Like, they weren't in a city. They were, like, out in yeah. the middle of nowhere. Truly really isolated. So, <sighs> it started defecting and, and escaping to the U.S. Embassy and then making claims of, like, um, he's abusive. Like, we have children, and then he claims them as his own. Or, like, uh, you know, we have a child. What? We have to kind of hand them over to, like, the, the lady who's in now called their mom like nobody's their individual kids parent and stuff and so what was their doctrine what was their like how did it what was it? you said it was like a bible bible thing bible um, church yeah it's a biblical base did he claim himself to be the messiah do you know no so you know it's actually really hard to find his actual like doctrine yeah well there's there's a really good documentary which if you I watched it years ago and I was going to rewatch it. And after researching this, I was like, I don't have the like emotional space for that right now. So it's but hard I to watch stuff because Jonestown. you'll hear more of his doctrine in that. Um, it's called Jonestown, the death of people simple. and from 2006. I think this is the one where they take the audio of what he's actually saying, like his real recordings of his sermons. And they do like reenactments of what went down. Um, so you can hear what he's like preaching, but it was biblical it was like Christian. But I don't know where he puts him. I think eventually he starts becoming a messiah. He becomes like a prophet at, towards the end. I'm pretty sure, but that was that's like old in, old research that I did. Um, but he's getting more paranoid, more paranoid. People are getting like a little freaked out by him, and so he starts doing these drills called the White Knight drills. Mm, mm. So he would wake everybody up in the middle of the night. And call him to the center, and he would say, okay, I have some Kool-Aid with some poison in it. Everybody step up, and we're all going to commit suicide together. I want your test of loyalty. And people wouldn't do it. And he would say, you need you need to be punished for this because you're not loyal to me. This was a trick. There's no poison. Mm. And he would do that weekly. Mm. Weekly, monthly, out of nowhere. They'd be woken up in the middle of the night. And so they were being sort of... They were being trained to like accept it and that he would have them drink it, tell them it, they would think it was real. And then they were desensitized to that, to that ritual, you know, and, and if you didn't do it, you were punished. And so people mm. drinking this Kool-Aid thinking there was poison in it. And then after a while they were like, okay, it's just a test of loyalty. You just have to do it. So um, finally a bunch of family members were like hearing reports of abuse coming out of this church and, um, they convinced the congressman, Leo Ryan, to go down and visit and, like, check was in. Was he with congressman him. from California? Yeah. Do you know? Yeah. Uh, I think so, yeah. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Um, yeah, I'm pretty sure he's from California. So he goes down in November of uh, 1978. 1978? Yeah. Um, flies down to Ghana, goes and stays two days. Yeah. And it's just kind of checking in, like, okay, this seems pretty pretty good. You know, they seem like they're happy. It seems like people are here on their own free will. Because um, they put on a freaking show. Did. Yeah, they made it, like, and nobody nobody say anything. Everybody be on your best behavior. Um, they, like, threatened them, right? Like, you better not tell them anything. Yeah. Ugh. So, on the way out, on the way out, Someone tried to stab him, the congressman, and he got away. They had to, they tried to stab him on the way out. He got away. He didn't get hurt. They make it to the airstrip and they're waiting for their plane to fly out of there. And as they're leaving, like members are like waiting for him as he's leaving. And then they're like, take me with you. Take me with you. I think there were like 20 people that were like, get me the F out of here. I want to go. And so he's kind of getting a little freaked out because he's like, oh, people actually aren't here on their free will. They're just afraid. Mm -hmm. to, like they're they're afraid. So they get to the airstrip and he brings like whatever, you know, like whoever he can fit. And uh, the soldiers hired by Jim Jones mm -hmm. um, shoot the congressman and four other journalists. So five people kill them, shot a bunch of people. A bunch of people were injured. But um Got out of there. Well, they died, right? The congressman died. Got convoluted because 
I think Jim Jones at the same time is sending one of his people out with the money and the gold and all oh, the documents. Probably. I'm sure. I think he sends them out and they actually are the ones who fly the plane out huh. with the people on it. I think. I don't. That was a convoluted. I was trying to connect those two stories because those are like happening in different areas of the thing. But anyway. the congressman died, right? So he congressman killed a congressman. And four journalists died, yeah. So they he killed him. So he's in so big trouble. That's all happening. And so Jones starts to gather everyone in the community and is like, do you think that the government is not now going to come after us now that the congressman has been killed? He's been ambushed. Um, we have nothing to live for. There's no hope. Everybody, we're going to we're going to commit this revolutionary, um, a revolutionary act is what he was calling it. So he lined up all this is where it gets shitty, guys, uh, lines up all of the children and old people first. And they give the tiniest babies the cyanide poisoning and the Kool-Aid powder first to show everybody, all of the adults, like all of your kids are dead. Mm. Now what do you have? What, now what do you have to live for? And like people are freaking out because they're thinking this is a drill. They've been doing this for months now. Now they're watching their children fucking die in front of them. And they're like oh, all the old people. Um, so, did yeah. they think it was a drill or did they think it was real because the congressman had just been shot and the guy was probably losing his mind? Yeah. I think right at the end he was like way out of his mind, way out, yeah. like popped out on drugs. Yeah. I'm, I think that they were probably freaked out but like maybe hoping it was a drill because after so many times of doing it over and over again, you'd be desensitized. We're like, surely we're not going to really do this. Like we've done this so many times where I thought it was real and, the, and it wasn't real. Maybe this is the same. I think mm. I think that was the point. That was the point of doing the the children and the old people first, though, mm. was being was to say like this is real poison, and I've taken away the most valuable part of our community. What do you have to live for? You just watch your child die. So, you know, afterwards, they found 900 bodies, 909 mm. to 914. There's like different. Um, that's why it was the biggest yeah. casualties before yeah, 9 like, 11. That's so many people. God, mm. But they, um, afterwards, when they, so this goes on, right? Everybody, and then Jim Jones eventually shoots himself. He doesn't even drink the poison, he shoots himself. Mm. Mm. So um, Jim Jones sent out letters telegrams to his headquarters hmm. said we're doing it you guys need to do it too and there were people in other places around the world in the headquarters like um san francisco had a headquarters they had one in like the georgetown and um there were people who committed suicide outside of the compound because they were got the telegram that said that we're all doing it and we're all going to be dead and you need to join us so they did it too. So they did it too. And so that sort of alerted like the outside government, like, mm. um, are they really doing a suicide out there? So they sent some soldiers in the next, in the next few days. And when they, they got here, everything. all of the people were just. <gasps> oh, those poor them. soldiers. I wonder if those soldiers are still alive. They must've been so traumatized. Awful. Um, and actually, the guy, can I just can I add something really, really quick that I forgot to mention? And then you just totally reminded me in Heaven's Gate, that same thing happened. After they committed suicide, there were three, after that big mass suicide, there were three former members that felt like they had missed out yeah. and that they had missed the hail bop comet. And so they committed suicide um, a few years later to go join their leaders. Yeah. How sad. Okay. I'm sorry. Go back. Um, mm. There's a lot of, there's a lot of um, like individual stories to this. Yeah. Too. It's interesting to you guys. You can go down a really long rabbit hole um i tried to get like the most the most like important one, like you know ones to add to the story but um when they when they were like going through the bodies they found a lot of them were injected in the back of the head mm, so they shot. didn't even know it was coming so people were refusing to do it and they mm. had to quite so, so that like, was clearly murder. Half of them were intentional. Half of them were probably murder. Yeah. Right. Like they had soldiers kind of lining the compound. So if people were trying to leave, they would just get shot. Um, mm. 
You know, they found syringes in people's arms, so they were very clearly like held down and and injected. And um, so they had backup plans. If they refused to drink the Kool Aid, then they yeah, would. they had soldiers like lined up to do it. See, in Heaven's Gate, they were happy. You know, they were doing it of their really of their own, like not their free will, because you know they were under mind control. But yeah. Man, that's so, so sad. Oh, and the other thing that I learned, too, was that and they poisoned all the animals, too. Yeah. Which I thought was interesting. They just didn't want to leave anything behind. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then there was a group, there was a group of uh, 10 people who, after the congressman left. Um, left or was killed? Oh, you mean, like, left, like the, left compound? the compound? and was supposed yeah. to fly home. Right. They were like, we don't want to be here anymore. Mm. They were freaked out. Just before all of this, before they knew what was going down, they snuck out of the jungle. They snuck out the side while the congressman was like saying goodbye because everybody was distracted. They, she took her baby, this this lady Leslie Wagner, um, strapped her baby on, left her entire rest mm. of her family mm. and um, ten other people, and they were like, "We're ready to leave. Let's go walk through the jungle and like go to the embassy and go like become refugees," you know. Mm. Um, not knowing what was coming. Like they didn't know about the congressman getting shot. They didn't know any of that was about to go down. And so their stories are sad because they have so much survivor's guilt because they were like, we thought we were just leaving the cult. We didn't know that we were leaving them the day that they were all destined to die. Like if we had been there, we would have also had to die too. And so, you know, they, they just think, okay, we're ready to leave this cult. But to find out that like, they left all of their sisters, their mom was, her mom was there, her, her sisters and brothers, like her whole family was in the cult and they all died that day. So mm. that freaking horrible. Um, Do you know if they're still alive? Uh, I wonder if, may, I feel like I've seen maybe some um, interviews and some documentaries. I don't know if they're recent, you know. Yeah, they said, I, I read two different accounts. One, one source said 36 people survived. Mm. And one said 85 survived. So I don't know. It's probably somewhere in, in between those two. But um, but an- another interesting thing was Jackie Spire, I think is how you mm-hmm. say it. She was the congresswoman. She was the congressman, uh, Leo Ryan's assistant at the time. And she was mm. shot on the airplane. Mm. Mm. But she made it out alive. And she's actually currently the 14th district uh, congresswoman right now in California. Wow, good for her. Yeah. So I thought that was interesting. Wow, that is interesting. I wonder if she takes a special interest in cults and mind you know, control. She wrote stuff. a book about it. Really? We should she check put it that out. on her book club. Yeah. What's her name? Uh, Jackie Spire, I think is how you say it. It's a S P E I E R. I want to check her out because, like, that's like a real first eyewitness account and like being in it one of you the know? few too, i mean i feel like with so many casualties the fact that there were any i have a question then this is all speculation this is just me and you talking do you think that um you know the congressman coming out there led to their suicide or do you think that it would have happened anyway or do you think that, okay, so here's the thing, and we're going to talk about this in Waco, is like the more you push a cult and the more you um, persecute them, the farther you push them into these, um, you know, crazy responses. So I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, I think the, I, I bet Jim Jones was just kind of waiting to see how the visit went. And then when he found out that the congressman was ambushed, I don't, he lost I don't his know mind. if he ordered it. I can't, I can't find it if. Jim Jones ordered the congressman to be murdered. Well, he was shot anyway by his people. Yeah. So I don't know how that happened. I don't know if it was like a misunderstanding or if he if he had him killed knowing that he was going to have everybody drink the Kool-Aid. But they said for like a for like a while leading up to it, like so many people around him were like, he's becoming unhinged. He's just right. like addicted to drugs. Um, I'm he's sure he had mental illness, narcissistic. Very so clearly. One account said that um, as a kid, he was obsessed with Hitler and mm. how Hitler committed suicide at the end of everything. And so I thought that was interesting. Do you know if he had trauma in his early childhood, Jim Jones? I'm sure he did. Hard, it's hard to it's hard to like filter past the actual event. And right, find because details. I know. Yeah, it's like um, there's so much information out there about like what happened that day. But like uh-huh. to go back, because I was trying to find like the 
like the doctrine of it of like what the hell mm. is he even teaching in the first place mm. and um it's hard to it's hard to like find stuff like that because it's mm. all kind of covered over with because that's the sensational part that's the part that people really want to focus on and that's why when I was in my cult you were always like oh my god Tony don't be like Jonestown don't drink the Kool-Aid that's another thing that people oh. hear commonly don't drink the Kool-Aid well you guys, that's a real thing that happened. Like, it's not funny. Don't say that. Yeah. Well, the thing too about Jonestown is that obviously I knew what Jonestown was, but mm -hmm. I happened to like come across the documentary one night when mm -hmm. you were really deep, probably the deepest you'd been in the church. Mm -hmm. And I watched this documentary and I was just like, I mean, I see how it happens. Mm -hmm. And it really freaked me out because I was like, if they ever ask you to, don't do it. And and then you also see, like, even if they ask you to and you don't want to do it, you could be put in a position where you don't really have a fucking choice. Or they yeah. trick you, you know? Yeah. Like, you could see yeah. how those fake white knight, like, that is really chilling to me, the um, the the fake drills that he was doing and, and desensitizing the people enough to when it came time to actually do it, it wasn't until they saw their kids dying that they were like, mm. oh, this is real. Like that to me is just like the most like horrific part of it, I think. Yeah. Obviously. The whole thing is horrific. It's just, it's just, it's just a perfect storm. You have this, you know, this, I don't know, cult leader and he was just able to isolate them out there in the middle of nowhere. And that's like a big the part perfect of storm of all mm -hmm. I was like, take all their money. He took their passports. But see, when you would, when I was in the cult and you would talk to me about Jonestown, I would get so um, annoyed, Mad. not just annoyed, um, like offended. Like, F you, you think that I am, my church is anything like Jonestown? Because when I saw Jonestown, I was like, no, that's clearly a cult. Yeah. But looking back now, like, I feel like the style, and I'm not saying that the church were, the church that I was in would ever do anything like this. I have, you know, I never heard anything like that when I was in it. I'm just saying disclaimer. But um, I think the style of it would be more similar to Heaven's Gate yeah. than to um, what happened in Jonestown. Right. Because in Jonestown, there was so much physical violence and sexual abuse and um, like that and drugs and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, Heaven's Gate was more like, uh, you you know, just like they were joyfully doing it for their God. You know, that's just something that I can more like willing participants of the members. Yes. Whereas, yeah, for sure. And like, both are awful. Both way, are awful. It feels way more murderousy uh, and violent and just like and predatory. Yeah. Predatory. Oh, that was the other thing. Seventy percent of the people that died were black. Wow. That so would just that's that's where it made me feel like um his initial you know and I don't know I don't know how that works. I mean maybe he just deteriorated mentally over time. So, like maybe mm -hmm. his intentions were were you know honest in the beginning of like let's bring let's bring America together. Like he really right. hated racism. He thought racism was going to be the downfall of American society and like that was like kind of his big catch in the beginning. Mm -hmm. And so, which is attractive, and people want to follow it, that. But his mm -hmm. congregation was like very heavily like African American families, and so. And didn't you say poor too, though? Yeah, like poverty, and so that was kind <sighs> of, and that's sort of like um, a very convenient teaching for like I think all of these organizations is to say like, you don't need money because money is like a, money is like a earthly thing, you know. If you mm -hmm. want like spiritual yeah. if you want spiritual like freedom or whatever like let's all yeah. pull our money give me your money and then we'll just mm -hmm. like, take care of your living needs but the way they did that in Jonestown was you guys are going to build the village and then you're going to farm your own food and you guys are all going to kind of be in charge of that yeah. and uh, I'll take all your money like if you get any like social security checks anything that but I can see how that's attractive like I oh, could want to live like that you oh, know okay. out in freaking <laughs> South America it was probably beautiful it was probably yeah. intense but it was and probably they beautiful mean, dude, I would have totally been like I know. sure I'm in South America and live on a commune that sounds fun I know but if we all just live as a big family that sounds great I'm into that like that sounds <sighs> that's that's why I was like man 
You know, it's not that far fetched to see how people are. But then they took their passports. I know that's scary. Don't ever give your passports, okay? Yeah. Public service announcement: If you go somewhere, and when when we went to Korea, we never we never handed over our passports. Yeah. We kept our passports, you know, with us. We were told like, but make sure you have it so that you can get back think home. That if you had been asked to hand them your, passports, I would have a hundred percent, a hundred percent. If they would have said, here, let me just hold on to it for your safekeeping. You know what? I wouldn't have even thought twice. I wouldn't have even thought twice. For real. And then it's like, you think about how easy that could happen. Like, what if they were like, you know what? We're actually going to extend the trip to another week. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, you know what? Actually, you know what? Thinking like, back, it's really like, scary. Yeah, it is really your family scary. And tell them that they should come out here. And why don't you guys yeah. move to South Korea, right? Like, right. it's easy to see how when you're in it. And then you're to a point where you're like, well, what am I going to do? They have my passport. Yeah. And I want my family out here. I'll just call You know, the scariest family. part was that my baby was here. Yeah, I think that's what happened in Jonestown is that a few family members would move down there and then they yeah. would call their family back home and be like, you guys should come down here. It's amazing. Yeah. Come on down. I want you here with me. Because I'm sure they like, couldn't openly communicate. They couldn't call and be like, oh, my God, help me. Yeah, that was the other thing. They censored the incoming and outcoming mail. Like they had like a group Control of, of information that would read through the letters before they would go out or before they would come in. There was like a there was like an office where they would do that. They would they would sift. There were people who were like dedicated to like sifting through and filtering. Mm. So, anyways, it's so sad. It's so sad, but we need to talk about it and we need to think about it because, of course, these are the extremes. But you know, there's millions of, you know, I don't know millions, but hundreds of thousands of cults out there. So you know, it's it's important. And these are popular. I say quote unquote popular. Um, I, like you said, Jonestown I, was like the biggest, yeah, Jonestown was the biggest uh, mass sui suicide of Americans. Yeah. Right. Uh, Heaven's Gate was the biggest mass suicide on American soil. Yeah. So it's, it was like the these, biggest mass casualty. Yeah. We need to learn from these. We need to learn from these, um, this history, you know, and understand how these beautiful, smart, interesting, um, young people, you know, were able to get caught up in in these cults and be manipulated by these uh, these leaders. Yeah, it's very it's an interesting like a study into like into uh, human behavior and groupthink. Yes. And how we are designed to live in a tribe, like we're right for survival. That's like right. how we're wolves in a pack. Well, that's yeah. like how we're, we're meant to like live in a small community of like 100 people. That's what our brains and our biology is like made to do. And so it feels natural to fall into these kinds of groups. And because normal American society is pretty isolated now, you know, you have like your like little inner family and then ho hopefully, you know, your um, immediate, your, you have your immediate family and then hopefully your you have a good community of like your aunts, uncles, cousins, you know? Yeah. But social media makes it so yeah. much more complicated. Yeah. That, yeah. There's like the whole, the whole study of how your brain can, it can't but, keep track of that many people. You're not supposed to have 600 friends. Okay. So see the whole thing is like in the 1970s and the 1980s and 1990s, even it's, it's not acceptable, but it's understandable how nobody really understood the psychology, you know, they were starting to understand, but now 2022, like, no, this shit cannot keep happening because we have the psychology and, you know, so this kind of leads us into our next episode. And I do, I want to shout out again, Steve Hassan. I can never shout him out enough, but his new podcast, you guys check it out. But, um, he was talking about how, when Waco happened, he called the government and he was like, you guys let me come in because I have experience. I have knowledge, you know, about cult and mind control. And they said, no, they didn't want him involved. They didn't want any outsiders involved. Yeah. And it was like, no, we need to be using people like him as good resources to help us understand to prevent tragedies like this from happening. Yeah. Or like, I think about what if Steve Hassan was involved in Waco? Like, would he have been able to de-escalate the situation Yeah. and stop the government from, you know, from from escalating the situation yeah. and that's what we're going to talk about next week is about waco and what else ruby ridge ruby ridge and waco but you guys check out steve hassan's um podcast because it's, it's getting so so good yeah 
Ugh. Yeah. It's uh, so the, interesting. The next one will be a little bit more like political because those those two accounts are like religious and political. So yeah, those are interesting in a different way. So next episode, we are going to explore Ruby Ridge and Waco and sort of how all of those things escalated. Uh, we're going to talk first about the doctrine of those things and the cult sort of side of it. And then we're going to have on a special guest. He's actually a childhood friend of ours. We've known him for years and years and years, and he has law enforcement experience. Um, and he's going to come on and discuss with us about the law enforcement side and, and why the government did what the government did, uh, because the ATF was involved, the FBI was involved, um, the local law enforcement was involved, and they've received a lot of criticism for, for what they did in Ruby Ridge and in Waco. And, you know, what happened in the at those times was also said to influence the Oklahoma City bomber. So it's like leads up to all these things in American history. So it's really important for us to examine. And I think that there is still a sentiment from lingering from those um, events that like still play totally. a role in our government, in society today. Like, you know, the, the little like side militias that form like yep. that kind of mentality, it kind of comes from when the government when the government does some of these things that they do, where you're like, that was a bad idea. I could have told you with no experience that that was probably a bad way to handle that. For sure. It just reiterates the the mind the the, the mindset for some of those people who are like, we got to form a militia against the government. Yeah. And it sounds radical, but you're also like, I mean, I. When you you can understand when you really think about mind control and stuff like that, then you can understand. I'm really excited for that episode. Yeah. And it's also going to be interesting because we have different political views than our guests that will be coming on. And I just love that. And I'm excited, you know, to see to see what kind of conversations we can have. Yeah. So what else do you want to say? I don't know. I, I feel so heavy and sad about this, but. I feel so connected to these people in these groups. Like, I, I feel like, um, I don't know, like we're kindred spirits or something. Yeah, that was um, harder for me to talk about than I thought it was going to be. Yeah, I understand. I forward to uh, this podcast, but now that I've done it, I'm like, ugh, I don't like it. You know, I kind of <laughs> want to cry. Um, I was I was watching the exit videos earlier, and I just, I just want to cry, you know, because they're just beautiful, beautiful people, you yeah. know. If you... Does their own research on Jonestown? Just be forewarned when you start putting that in your Google search. The images are like horrific. They are, like, and I'm sure many people are familiar. Yeah. Yeah. If you don't want to see it. Don't do it. Watch that documentary. What did you say it's called? Uh, Jonestown. Uh, Jonestown: The Life and Death of the People's Temple. Yeah. I think you can uh, watch it on Prime. You mm. might pay for it. But um. There's so many out there. I mean, yeah, there's so I'll many. Pass. I mean, if you, if you want to go down the rabbit hole, there's so many good documentaries about it. But, but, but as a former cult member, I don't think it's a good idea, you know, to um, go to your family member if they are still in the cult. Don't come to them with all this information. It's not helpful. Yeah. It's helpful to maybe you as a family member to understand, but if you go at them with this information about, you know, Jonestown or anything, they're, it totally turns them off. And that's okay. I understand why you would want to, of course. That was probably our brief period where I was kind of coming at you a little heavy, where I was like, I don't like it. I don't like your church anymore. <laughs> Get out. But like I said, the more you push, and that's what we're going to talk about Waco a lot, the more you push members the more they think they're being persecuted and the more they they're joyful about that because they say look the bible said we're going to be persecuted the bible said the world's going to hate us and then they see that as a fulfillment yeah and it pushes them more into the extreme belief so and I, think, I think it's just some, not helpful some of the similarities is that you know they all sound so different but they're all following the i mean all of these the um, extreme religions are following a bible that at the end of the day, I mean, it does have passages in it that says these things. Like the Bible, it can all be justified. I know. When I found out Heaven's Gate was a Bible based, I couldn't believe it. Actually, T and Joe, they proclaim that they're the two witnesses in Revelation. I don't know if you guys are anybody that's religious, you know, there's two witnesses. And um, they said that they have to be martyred and raised from the dead. And it's like so many religions use this verse to justify whatever kind of thing they have going on. Yeah. 
I but mean, that's what that, they taught. They taught revelation. If you read that book, you can interpret it in so many ways. I, know. So, I just feel like growing up, we were taught, oh, those were crazy UFO people. Those were crazy space alien people. But like, but no. It, they're all following they, the same book. <laughs> they were like Christians who were believing in God and they believed in Jesus too. Yeah. They just believe that T and Doe were like, you know, like the reincarnation of God, I think, and like the fulfillment of God's prophecy. So There's I don't so know. There's so many different plot lines in the Bible that you could really like, if you wanted to just isolate one chapter or one section of it, that and you create could kind your of create cult. your own theology. Oh, Lindsay, what was the name of that, uh, that, that movie where he tried to make his own cult Oh, and, and it worked? Let me look it up really quick because I really I want you guys to good. watch it. I really, oh, that one, that one's fun. Fun and sad, but it's like a comedy. It's set up like a comedy, so it's really this man who is, and he wants to see if he can just start a cult, and so he becomes like a guru, just a fake guru, though, to see if he can get followers, and he does. And it kind of starts off like he he's doing it kind of as a joke. Yeah. Let's see if I can get any followers, and like by the called Kumari. I'm sorry. Yeah. No, Kumari. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's. Yeah, as it's happening and unraveling, you can see that he's kind of in shock because he's like, oh, shit, I didn't think this is really going to work. I know people start like he does all the classic things that a cult leader would do. And then, you know, it actually works. It's called Kumari. It's on Tubi, which is sort of like a random thing, but it's free. If you just look it up, Kumari, K-U-M-A-R-E. It's really, really good. And the guy's fascinating. He's actually a comedian, you know. Yeah, yeah I think that's it, girl. What else do you want to say? I'm just sad. Hey. Oh. I know. I feel sad, too. I do. Sorry, feel guys. Sad. Sorry, everyone. If you guys are feeling sad, just like do something good for yourself. It is sad, but it's necessary. We got to talk about this. this is the real shit. Yeah. You know, it is real. It really happened. And like the more you learn about it, the sadder it is because the realer it is. Exactly. That's that's how it feels like the more you can relate to them. It's not just like some weird thing you heard about on TV. Yeah, the headline of it is like, man, that's sad. But then, like, you really like go into the details. You're like, oh my god, it's so so. Sad. Jonestown is so sad because of the children. The children, and it was so violent. It was so violent and it's isolated. Just, it's exactly like you said. They're grown adults. They were willingly, happily doing it. It's so sad for their families. But at least there's like a piece to that where you know that they weren't like. Getting they did what they the wanted. Yeah. They weren't being like shot in the back of the head. as they But, were. but like, at the same time, did they do what they didn't really do what they wanted because they weren't in control of their own mind at that point. You know, they were totally manipulated. They weren't their self. They were their cult identity. And that's why it's just so funny. I mean, a piece up. of like, at least when they died, they did. Right. It. Right. For sure. I don't, oh, girl. I'm going to go have a good cry now. Yeah. That's okay. We need it. That's what I'm learning in my burnout book. You need a good cry. Yeah, I hope everybody's reading it. It's really interesting. I'm getting through it little by little. And in a few episodes, we're going to do a whole a whole thing about the burnout book. So you guys stay tuned on that one. It's really good. Yay. It's really good. Honestly, I have been feeling a lot of stress, like watching, a, you know, the videos that have been put out and they're really helpful, but they are heavy. You yeah. know, it's it brings back a lot of trauma. So thank you guys for being here with me through the whole journey and being with us and been really fun yeah all right we'll see you guys next week next time i don't know when it'll come next out. time stay safe stay stay healthy stay free stay free stay free boom baby boom baby boom baby hey.